probably moving on to the next session uh, of this workshop, which is con concerned with what can we do about all that. And um, David uh, from Sweden is going to give us a social perspective on these things. Let's see if I can get that all right. Yeah, very good. Okay, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a social worker, and the, uh, what I would like to do is just simply contribute some thoughts. Not because there's a lot of data or a lot of activity in social work on the subject of obesity, but precisely because there isn't. Um, my own uh, entrance into this field, I don't actually work with the uh, obesity as such, is by being married to Christina Fleetwood for 40 years. Uh, so I have seen close up uh, when she's been smaller as she is today and when she was bigger as she was before and all the stages she's gone through in the past. I've been brought along on many such occasions as today. I've read quite a lot of the literature by now. And uh, I noticed today, which I've noticed earlier, that for example, Tamina and some of the other people have touched on social issues, particularly when they're talking from the direction of stigma, which is uh, Christina's or Rebecca Pools and so forth. But I haven't really heard anybody talk about it with the uh, sort of uh, glasses that we social workers have. Um, and uh, another point along that line is that uh, I teach uh, at the Stockholm University uh, Social Work School and Christina did uh, previously uh, for a few years. She uh, suggested that, uh, that uh, uh, to her couple of students as a subject for uh, 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 their senior thesis, uh, they were right on obesity and it was quite a sensation because nobody had ever done it before. Uh, so this, I would simply like to contribute some thoughts based on parallels which I see uh, concerning social perspectives on obesity because I recognize them with a wide variety of other illnesses and conditions. Oh, this is a little bit slow. Next one, please. But what I'm saying is that all illnesses, all conditions occur in a social context. Uh, if they don't, you know, okay, we've heard a lot about genetics, and certainly that's true, but there definitely is a social context uh, around the person, and that context can either provide support, if it's positive, which may help to reduce symptoms and may help treatment, but can also be, for many cases, a negative context, where the social support is much less or even negative, and this can aggravate symptoms. And without getting in too deep, I've heard people argue in some other areas that it can actually be seen as a root cause, or at least a contributing cause to some diseases. And maybe that's true of obesity. And just to give a couple of very different examples of what, it can, what this can mean, uh, this example is relatively simple. Uh, it's, a, it's an old source, but it happens to be one I have access to is from Stockholm University. Uh, this uh, researcher followed people with diabetes uh, for a period of time, and she was interested in what factors may, could make treatment more or less successful. And she came up with a couple, a couple of things I quote here. Um, one of the first thesis, as she calls it, she says, forward-looking persons, that is patients, can, with the help of activities, in other words, being active in their own treatment, and an acceptance of their illness, and with social support in the process of change, gain control over their illness, thus leading to good treatment outcomes. Now, there's a lot more in here than part of the social, all of the social perspective. This is also about empowerment, which uh, Marilyn is going to do a workshop on uh, tomorrow, we would love to have more space to talk about that now. But it is saying that in a positive process, social support is very important. She found that in respect to diabetes. And another comment she had was that healthcare professionals need to develop a relationship with the patient which is based on trust and understanding of what the illness means to the patient, what the consequences are for the patient, and how this illness influence the patient's social situation. 
Now this is much wider, and it might not be that a doctor can do all of this, but it is something which has to be considered because it's going to affect whether or not you're going to have that uh, successful treatment. But then to the other kind of example, a much different example, and this is the example where the kind of example where I have met obesity in the field and in research. Not identified as a subject, simply as something that comes up and meet people who have <coughs> problems. And that's dysfunctional families. And dysfunctional families have any kind of imaginable problem. Um, now think about that the family is our, is not only, the, as I've written here, the, the more main, at least the most basic organizational form we have in society, we have in society, it's also where we get our basic safety, not the least when we're growing up. So if you're going to deal with any kind of problem that you have, you have to have some kind of a safe basis. And if you're in a severely dysfunctional family, then you're not going to have that. But just imagine what it might mean to uh, say, we'll take a young person, say a 14 or 15 year old girl developing obesity and She's maybe gotten some attention from the school nurse, for example, and we're talking about that she needs to eat better, she has to get more exercise and so forth, but when she comes home, she's worried about whether dad is going to be drunk, is he beating her mother, is she going to beat her, she has to be thinking about maybe her younger uh, brothers and sisters who she has to take care of, maybe mom just lies in bed all day every day, and in this environment, so far or another, she's supposed to deal with her developing obesity, even with medical support. Now, the thing is, that's severe, and those are the cases that I, that I have met. Now, what about the, all the ones who are only partially dysfunctional? Uh, where, you know, it kind of looks okay on the outside. People wouldn't think about, you know, that it's not safe at home. And I thought I was trying to think of what might be a possible example, and I thought of, well, uh, okay, uh, I thought of, say that this 14-year-old uh, uh, has understood that she needs to be more physically active and she's been bullied for, for being fat, but she's found some place where maybe she could play volleyball because she has some friends who've been nice to her and might be okay. So the only problem is to get there she has to have bus money and she has to ask dad for bus money and she doesn't know whether this is going to be the time that dad's going to be nice and give her the bus money or the dad going to get mad and say, we don't have money for that kind of thing, and give her a big slap in the face and say, don't bother me anymore. I think we have to start thinking about these kinds of issues. For a lot of people, it's not that they have a safe environment around them where they're going to have to deal with the obesity problem. So just to say it roughly, kind of hypothetically, how might it be? There are stigmatizing attitudes within, within families, we know that, if it's also dysfunctional, it can lead to a social network for the child, for this growing person is uh, either isolated or maybe bullied. When they get to school, these kinds of problems build over to the school. They don't maybe want to go to school. They don't, can't, don't have attention to study. Studies don't go well. They don't get to go to college later on, even if there were money, because they don't have good grades, don't have good results. This leads to poorer jobs, which leads to poorer employment which be maybe the housing problems, even hopeless, homelessness, but really goes bad. Poorer prospects all across the board for giving any kind of uh, medical help or help for their obesity problems. Mm -hmm. I would like to see more of these kind of issues being addressed. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Um, so just Wait, and I love that I've followed after a social uh, talk, a talk about social determinants. I'm an occupational therapist by training. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, uh, Alberta, Canada. And as an occupational therapist, we do look at um, people living with chronic diseases through uh, physiology, social determinants, and also personal factors, including eating. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about a project that is. Uh, pretty exciting to us in Alberta. Uh, it's through the Medicine Hat Regional Hospital. This is a fairly typical full-service hospital uh, in Alberta. Some would consider it rural Alberta. It's sort of a smaller city. 
Uh, and what we are trying to do is we are trying to create standards, the first standards for bariatric friendly hospitals that will be required through accreditation standards. So that what we're hoping to do is pilot some recommendations so that every single hospital in Alberta and we hope across Canada will have to meet these standards so that hospitals, regardless of why a person's coming into hospital, are safe, accessible, and sensitive to <coughs> the care needs for patients with bariatric care needs. Now, I realize that in this picture, I'd like to say it was taken recently. It was about a year and a half ago. I'm actually wearing the same outfit that was not planned at all. Um, and my hair is a little darker. This is the team. This is the team that we work with. So none of this work happens without a really comprehensive interprofessional or interdisciplinary team. In this photo, we have nurses, we have people living with obesity, we have industrial designers, we have capital planners, we have administrators, we have VPs of hospitals. You might recognize, uh, I think Ari is in this picture, or should be in this picture. You might have stepped out. He's not. He should be. We'll post him in there. Oh, you took the picture. Okay, that's why. Um, and we also have um, designers who design processes that work with us. So you can see all the little post-it notes in the back. That was after a full day's worth of work where we'd call these ideation sessions where we pull together all kinds of ideas to develop solutions. So you can see this is our team here. So it's really very multidisciplinary. So the Bariatric Friendly Hospital Care Hospital Project is, to, as I said, to develop standards. And the standards um, will support healthcare providers to become more knowledgeable about obesity, to work effectively and compassionately with patients with obesity, and to develop competencies in the area of safe patient handling and safe clinical care. So the priorities, you won't be able to see this very clearly, but I'll list them. After meeting with patients, we've been doing, working on this project for almost five years now. After interviewing numerous individuals living with obesity and healthcare providers and administrators from all across Canada and most um, focused in Alberta, we identified five priorities. <coughs> One was professional competencies. So making sure that every healthcare professional and every administrator or person that makes a decision about budget knows that obesity is a chron chronic disease and is worthy of the attention that we're giving it. We are also stating that weight bias sensitivity training is an absolute necessity for anybody who has interactions with patients in a hospital. It doesn't matter if you're putting the food tray in through nutrition services, or you're greeting the person who's coming in for a medical procedure, or you're transporting some patient from uh, diagnostic imaging back to their room. Everyone is supposed to be having a weight bias education. The other priority is safety. So under safety, we want that healthcare providers have access to the equipment and know how to use it so they can move and transfer patients safely and with dignity to protect the patient but also themselves. The third priority is transitions in care. We want to make sure that there are not delays in care. We know from the research that we've done that people living with obesity spend up to twice as long in the hospital and it's not because they're more ill. It's because there's so many delays in their care. They're left lying in bed longer. They're left um, without um, access to diagnostic imaging. They're left waiting in hallways while beds and walkers and wheelchairs are rented from an outside source. All of these things create expensive delays in care and is disrespectful. We also want to, another priority is making sure that hospitals have the equipment and supplies that they need on hand, ready to go, so that when a patient comes in, we don't know all the time when someone's coming in. They come in for emergency procedures. We don't want the healthcare team scrambling for resources. We want everything there to be ready and seamless. And the fifth priority is analytics. Uh, a lot of people think this is the most boring one. As a researcher, this is the most nerdy, exciting one for me. <laughs> um, because without numbers, we found when we were trying to do research, when I first got to Alberta, I thought, oh, this is great. We're going to see what's happening in the hospitals. We were going into medical records, and we were finding up to 65% of the inpatient population did not have a body weight recorded in their medical record. So it's a huge problem. And if we don't know how much a patient weighs, how do we know we're using the right size equipment to work with that patient safely? 
So I'll go through quickly some of the key standards and recommendations that we have. So what the first standard is that patients with bariatric care needs will have interactions with all staff, administrators, and physicians that establishes a foundation of trust and collaboration and is free from weight bias. This is going to be woven through the mission statement of the hospital. Uh, the recommendation, as I said, is that everybody will have training. We are developing some modules that will be required as part of your annual performance review with Alberta Health Services that the, you, will not be, you will be held accountable if you haven't done the training. The other recommendation we have is that every patient presenting or admitted to the hospital will have their body weight and height recorded in a standardized location in the medical record. End of story. We need that information. We don't need that information so that we can encourage people to lose weight. We need this information so that we can match equipment and services and resources appropriately. The recommendation then is that we're moving to electronic medical records, which boggles my mind we're not there in this day and age, but we're not, we still use paper, is that you will not be allowed to close the medical record until you have entered a height and weight. So we're forcing that hand. <coughs> The third recommendation is that the appropriate size equipment will be available for use by patients and staff. Sounds simple, but when we did an inventory across the Medicine Hat Regional Hospital, we realized there were so many gaps where certain services did not have access to, let's say, a wheelchair that can support a client with bari bariatric care needs. The recommendation then is that it is already, we're going to be using GPS tracking technology so that we always know where the equipment is. Anyone who's worked in a hospital knows, and I went through this so many times as an occupational therapist, that we're looking for the right size sling to do a mechanical lift or transfer, and we have no idea where the sling is. But if it's got a GPS tracker, I'm going to know exactly which nurse is hiding that sling, and I'll be able to find it. <laughs> the fourth recommendation is that all staff will be knowledgeable on safe patient handling. With our project, we have developed six new bariatric lifts and transfers of training videos <coughs> that are going to become required training as part of all the occupational health and safety training for lifts and transfers for everybody. And the fifth one is that communication of bariatric care needs will be clearly uh, stated so that there is no gaps in service. And I'm wrapping up really quick. <laughs> Um, guidelines for the care of hospitalized patients with bariatric care needs. We are publishing guidelines that we hope to be released in June of 2018. The thing is, there's nothing really new about what we're putting into these guidelines, but what we've done is we've gone across North America to pull the best of the best and pull them into one cohesive guideline that then can be adapted to it for anybody to use in whatever context that they're doing. And we're planning on developing the same guidelines for home care and community care. This is what we did with our group. We mapped every single touch point in the patient's journey in the hospital to find out where we needed to intervene. And the recommendations that we came up with are a result of all of this work. This is how having a designer involved in your work is really valuable. Um, I've been using the word bariatric care needs. This is an algorithm that we've created. Again, it's not rocket science, but it boggles my mind it hasn't been done before is flagging the need of a client as soon as they come into the hospital. So what we've defined as bariatric care needs is the first red flag that we have to highlight do we need to pay more attention for equipment needs is 250 pounds. That is not heavy. But most standard hospital equipment, including probably the chairs that are available in waiting rooms and in most exam rooms, are <coughs> maximum 250 pounds. And I'm getting the pull, the hook is coming. We also use designers to create new furniture. We've redesigned the Medicine Hat Regional Hospital Cafeteria. Um, and this is our training facility in Alberta where we're doing a lot of the training of healthcare professionals. And there we go. Thank you. Thank you. So there were a lot of potential solutions and coming from different directions very nicely. And we have uh, another solutions at the policy level. So, Joe, you're back on stage here. Yes. Thank you very much. So happy to be back. Uh, so I'm going to go really practical here and talk about what we've done in the U.S. to try to address a bias. Um, I previously disclosed uh, my disclosures. So we really are starting out at the real basic level, which is education, right? We are um, trying to educate the public um, 
and people living with obesity about bias, everything from traditional brochures and guides, and also some information for the media as well to help them better understand um, appropriate ways to represent people living with obesity. And this really comes from our observation of doing this now for more than a decade that uh, most people who engage in bias aren't doing it because they're intentionally trying to be cruel. They're doing it because they don't understand, they lack the knowledge of what they're doing. It is unintentional, it's ignorance. Um, and so we start from that place. We don't immediately jump to the assumption that someone is uh, doing or engaging in these kind of activities out of uh, a, a decision to be malicious or be cruel. Um, and that's helped us in most cases. I would say if I had to estimate those numbers, it's 80% ignorance and 20% cruelty, um, depending on the situation. But most of the people that I've had to engage with and or even call them out on their bias, uh, by the time I'm done with the conversation, uh, it is usually because of their ignorance, not because of, uh, of, um, of cruelty. Though, if you've ever read the uh, message boards after a article about obesity on the internet or something along those lines, I think you will find the people that we call trolls that engage in that kind of cruelty. We've also done a lot of work with uh, education of healthcare providers, and we already heard uh, already about the influence that they have on people with obesity. And I, I wanted to point out this one uh, project to you, and this is a uh, competency project. So we already heard uh, Mary mentioned competencies already in, in her presentation just a second ago. And in the US, we've actually developed a competency list for healthcare professionals. And so really what this is meant to be used for is to guide whatever the healthcare professional group is and actually developing their training and their certification. And I, and I wanna point out that there are only 10 competencies, but two of them are listed here are related to bias. And so I think that was pretty impressive to me to see the US uh, healthcare community actually putting these in place. Um, and uh, this was a, a, a great project moving forward. The references are there if you want to track it down and download it. The other thing we do, of course, is have to educate our policymakers. And what's not depicted on here is the primary way we do that is actually bring forward people who live with obesity and actually take them to state capitals or to the uh, US Capitol in Washington, DC to actually meet legislators. Because when you humanize this condition and you actually show people these are real people we're talking about, not statistics, um, it makes a meaningful difference. But we've also done it in other ways. Um, and in fact, um, just like the public, our policymakers respond to advertising campaigns. And so we've done a variety of them in the US, um, whether it's ads in airports, the major airports in DC. So how it works when you're an elected official in, in Washington, DC, is that you fly in Tuesday morning and you usually fly out Thursday night. They really, our legislators only work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Friday, and the weekend they're supposed to be in the home district. So we try to hit them when they're in the airport. Uh, and then there are actually um, newspapers that are specifically for legislators, uh, Roll Call, Politico, among others, and we run advertisements in those as well. Um, and really the thought process here is, uh, just like Aria talked to us about, about the complexity of obesity, is we actually try to convince our elected officials that obesity is complicated. And we do that because we recognize that you're actually less likely to engage in stigma if you understand obesity is complicated. And so it's a starting point. Obviously, we want to go much further with our elected officials, but a good starting point for them is actually to convince them that obesity is complicated, just like obesity stigma is complicated as well. Now, I mentioned the media before, and I pick on them a lot, and uh, I get to do that again on Thursday when we do a master class with members of the media here, but I will speak positively about them for a second because we do uh, see them as an ally at times, and these are some headlines that have been recent examples uh, that have uh, come forward and really this idea that you know blame and shame are part of the problem is starting to come through uh, in the media and so while we've often seen them as our enemy um, and the purveyors of stigma and bias uh, they are at, at times now uh, moving forward and um, making it making a difference in our efforts moving forward the other thing that we've actually done that we found really uh, powerful is actually to give people a way to report bias so we actually have a weight bias reporting tool on the Obesity Action Coalition's website, and it's pretty remarkable the kind of stories we receive from this. Now, we haven't published the data yet, though we will uh, in, in the future, but I will tell you that 90% of the reports of bias that we receive are from people who talk about being stigmatized by a healthcare provider. 
So it shows us a target of where it is important that we do work uh, moving forward. Um, and then we have a task force. We actually have a group of volunteers who look at these issues that get reported and actually offer advice to the person who reported them. So maybe they're writing to us about a bad experience with a healthcare provider, or maybe they're writing to us about an advertising campaign they weren't comfortable with, and we would actually then turn around and respond to those issues as an organization. You know, one of the things that we emphasize the most is appropriate imagery. Um, and uh, we've probably seen, actually we've seen a couple of these images in the slides here, but OAC along with many others uh, throughout the world actually have produced uh, appropriate image galleries. How we depict people with obesity, you know, the fact that almost always they're headless and they're always slovenly dressed and they're always eating poor quality foods, that has to change. And so we've actually created a data bank of, of, of photos for people to use. Um, and we slowly are seeing adoption of these images. We see it much higher among our healthcare provider friends giving their presentations. Hopefully the media will buy into them uh, soon as well, especially since they're free for them to use. The other thing we've spent a lot of time around is language and trying to convince people to adopt what we call people first language when it comes to obesity. So you will not hear me, unless I'm quoting someone, use the word obese. Okay, because we don't say someone's cancerous, we say they have cancer, right? So we, people have obesity, they're not obese. Um, and, and I think this is important. And I will tell you that um, in addition to the American Medical Association recognizing obesity as a disease a number of years ago, just two years ago, they recognized the fact that people first language should be used for obesity. It's kind of sad they had to do a separate resolution for that because their existing resolution said that all diseases should be referred to uh, in, in, in a people first way or a person first way, but um, they did and uh, at least in our mind a little bit of progress and uh, since he's here today, I'll, uh, we'll quote Ted right here and, and he said it so very well, obese is an identity, obesity is a disease. By addressing the disease separately from the person and doing so consistently, we can pursue this disease while fully respecting the people affected. And, I, and that's an important quote, and uh, thanks, Ted, for, for sharing that. The other thing, of course, OAC is known for is our activism. And so I just want to talk to you a little bit about what we've done activism-wise, and these are some of the issues we've taken on. Yes, uh, the, those are all real things. There are uh, Facebook pages that talk about uh, fat kids being easier to kidnap and, and things along those lines. The reality is what's out there is pretty horrible. Um, I will tell you that from our perspective, activism is the number one issue among OAC members. Um, they, and we use all kinds of different um, ways to address this. You see them there. Um, and our process almost always starts polite, okay? A nice letter saying, hey, you're doing this wrong. But we do get um, not so nice if need be moving forward. Um, and we've used this technique pretty successfully. I will tell you one thing to keep in mind, that not everyone thinks of bias the same way. So what I consider bias, you may not, and, and vice versa. Um, and that definition has been a challenge for one of our working committees who works on this, to actually say, is this bias or is it not bias? Uh, it's not always 100% black and white. Um, I will tell you that in, in the US, our healthcare providers have been a key champion in addressing uh, bias. I already mentioned the AMA. However, we have to stay on top of them. So all of our health-related organizations and obesity say, we're gonna use people first language, and then I go to their meetings and uh, maybe 20%. <laughs> Look at their journals, maybe 30%. So it is a little bit of a learning process, but I will admit it took me two years to get that language out of, uh, out of my own vocabulary. Um, fat shaming discussions are definitely more mainstream, and then those aren't always about obesity, and that difference is sometimes challenging. And then I, I think I need to acknowledge, um, in the U.S., we don't have a great relationship with our uh, partners in the uh, size acceptance movement. However, they've played a role in this space, and I think there's things to learn. So when I went to the Menes meeting in Canada, we learned much more. And I will just say that we see bias improving. So this is the data from that Ted showed you from around the world. This is the U.S.-specific data. We see a reduction in this blaming of obesity. And we see an increase, the red dotted lines, on the recognition of obesity as a disease. So we are making progress through these efforts, slow but steady. Thank you very much.